you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Matthew chapter 24. As you are opening your Bible to Matthew chapter 24, I would ask, please multitask and pray with me. Oh, great God of heaven, as we sang earlier, you are a God who speaks, and you've given us your word. And your word is a gift. Lord, we're so very grateful that we might fellowship with you this way, and that you might speak to our minds and to our hearts to know what it is that you would have us do. We'd be lost, of course, without your spirit leading and guiding, convicting and teaching and encouraging us in these things. And so we ask. Have your way with us this morning. Lord, I'd ask that I might be on your page and that I might not add any thought or take anything away to confuse the work that you're doing. That we might, all of us, be, uh, Lord, in alignment with your, your plan and with your will. That you might be glorified, Lord, and that this group of people might feel ever closer to you. So lead and guide this time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Article 9, and in Article 9, uh, we surmise Scripture in saying that we believe in the personal, bodily, and glorious return of our Lord Jesus. The coming of Christ, at a time known only to God, demands constant expectancy, and, as our blessed hope, motivates the believer to godly living, sacrificial service, and energetic mission. Last week we began a time in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, and I said it was kind of like a 10,000 foot view, uh, looking down on what Jesus was teaching in this Olivet Discourse to his disciples who said, Ooh, look at the pretty building. And Jesus is like, oh. I tell you the truth, not one stone is going to be left upon another. And the disciples are like, what? Are you serious? And he says, yeah, it's all going to be torn down. And then the disciples ask what all of us would like to ask, and that is, how? When? When, when is this going to happen? And then he proceeds to go through a two-chapter teaching time. And last week, as I introduced it in the beginning of chapter 24, then the summation of what we had studied in Article 9, we looked at uh, the, the last part of chapter 25. I told you last week that what I really wanted you to do was to read through the previous chapter and a half. And that we would talk about those things today, and that's indeed what we're going to do. But as a point of summary, of kind of that 10,000 foot view, here's uh, our summary of this teaching between uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1, and chapter 25, verse 46. The return of Jesus may be lengthy, so let's make sure we endure it with patient anticipation. Part two, excuse me, point number two, Christ's return will, even in that way, will, when it happens, be sudden and unexpected. The judgment of Jesus will be irreversible. Number four, when Christ returns, the truth in all of it will be revealed. Number five, each individual will be personally accountable at the time of Christ's return. And the future for those who are faithful is going to be glorious and joy-filled. Point number seven, the destiny of those who are lost will be absolutely and undeniably dreadful. When we study the things of Christ and His second coming, as I said last week, I proposed that there were three groups of people, those who found it fanciful and, and hard to believe, uh, those uh, right, who, who really want to study all the in-depth timelines and charts like Ezekiel and, and Daniel and Revelation. And, and then I said there's the third group uh, who are people who just are, un, you know, like the Bible says it, that's fine. I just, I'm, I'm not informed. I, I, I don't know much about that. And I propose to you that those were those three groups. Uh, I need to apologize because there's a fourth. There's a fourth group of people. And there's a number of these, uh, in this fourth group, there's a number of them who are here as a part of our body. And those are a group of people who hold well the tension and balance Right? Knowing that Christ is going to return and at any moment and are living their lives out faithfully, investing in what Christ is invested in. They are 
They are, they are the people that are sharing and teaching and, 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 and growing in their relationship with Christ. Unwavered, unshaken by the circumstances of life. And so I want to make sure that you understand that, that we're in all. Now how do we get everybody in the first three groups to group number four? That's my burden. That's my heart for the week. Okay? Because when we look, and I'm not going to read it in depth, but as I've already kind of paraphrased, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 24, beginning uh, in verse 1, Jesus leaves the temple. He says, it's coming down. And then the disciples say, hey, when is this going to happen? And Jesus begins to teach them some things. And I want to, I think last week I maybe read through this kind of fast. I want to read through it again uh, and ask you all some more questions. Look at verse 4. See that no one leads you astray. And right away, that ought to put us on alert. Well, what do you mean, astray? Uh, I thought I was following you. You are. But obviously, what Jesus is trying to teach us is that there's going to be some challenges, some stretching. There's going to be, there's going to be some refining, right, of what you say you believe and how it affects your life. Don't be led astray. He then goes on to say, many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Christ. And then in verse 6, he starts sharing with us some things that, well, quite honestly, are pretty distressing. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. Yeah, right. I'm still working on a stray. Right? Now you're talking about war? And then he goes on verse 4 and 7. He says, nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines. There'll be earthquakes. They will deliver you, uh, verse 9, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated. And so here's this document. If you sign on for all of these things, please sign the dotted line. Wait a minute, wait a minute. When you shared with me the gospel, and what you just said a little bit earlier is, God loves me, and if I ask for forgiveness, He'll forgive me, and then I can go to heaven. That's what I want. Yeah, who wouldn't? But we have this time between here, right, <laughs> and there. And He's coming back. And there's going to be some hard stuff. And if we're honest, war, famine, death, being hated, tribulation, none of that stuff sounds like fun. Right? No? No. It does not sound good. And in that, now, I go, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Now I understand that he said, don't be alarmed, but I am alarmed. How do I endure those things? How do we endure those things? Right? Now we might even get a glimpse as to why people might be led astray. <laughs> because, look, Jesus said it's going to get really hard and really bad for a while. And if somebody comes along and says, hey, you can be free from this and you don't have to suffer and you don't have to be in tribulation, you can, right, follow me. I'm a follower of Jesus. Yeah, I'm Christ's return. And be led astray. To be led out of your circumstance, led out of your travail, led out of, well, I don't know, whatever. And so even though um, this list um, is troubling and scary, right, for honest if we're honest with what's going on inside of ourselves, we read things like abomination of desolation. We read things further on in chapter 24 about fleeing from Judea. Great tribulation, such has not been from the beginning of the world until now and never will be. And all of these things building up to when Christ returned, verse 29, immediately the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will shake. On Tuesdays, we say we believe in an all-powerful God. On Wednesdays, we say, I live my life for the glory of God. 
on Thursday, right? You see what I'm saying? Power and glory and majesty. And we sing about these things and it makes us feel good. But a day's coming. And make no mistake that when He comes in His glory, it will be the most incredible and profound demonstration of holiness that this world has ever seen. Hosts of angels. The blast of a trumpet. And this man, Jesus, who was, who was cast aside and given a criminal's death, who came on a donkey, who came low, who had no earthly possession to speak of, is going to come in all of his majesty. And the Lord of lords and King of kings is going to arrive. Amen. And when he does, it is going to make your knees Weak. One of two reasons. When I was just sharing that with you, I'm getting visions of how I put all of this stuff into pictures, and I almost fell on my knees. <laughs> because I love him so much, and I can't wait for him to, re to receive the respect and the honor and the glory that he's due. And now I know that piece of scripture that, that, that when he comes, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Jesus is Lord. It is those who have put their faith and trust in Him because we love Him and He's our King or to those who have said, eh, forget Him, right? And they were made to be subject to Him. But there's going to be some hard stuff between here and there. Jesus goes in and sharing all of these things and I got to imagine but those disciples who had just earlier said, wow, look at the pretty building, are sitting there going, uh, when you said they'll hate us, did you mean all of us? Like, are we all going to die? And are you just talking about Rome or is this, right? Blowing their gourd. And he tells them, watch for these signs, be aware. And last week we looked at being prepared, we we're ready, right? And the expectancy and those things that go along with it. Jesus then gives two examples, and those are where we want to turn today. Look with me at chapter 25. Chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Jesus gives us two examples. And in these examples, he's going to give us those things that we need, that we might be adequately equipped, right? So that since we know, right? So, right, remember what Jesus said, I tell, you these, I tell you these things in advance so that you might believe, right? And so all of these things, we realize that he's sharing with us so that we might know. And in our knowing that we can be prepared, ready, and actually end up, as a result, longing for the glorious reappearing of King Jesus. Because eventually what's going to happen as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ is that there is going to be a greater and greater schism. And you're sitting here saying to yourself, how can there be any more turmoil in the world than there is today? Yeah, that's a warning. That's a heads up, heads up, hint, hint, hint. And if we had more time and place, we could go through all of these different things. And as I said before, that's a study in Daniel, a study in Ezekiel, a study in Revelation. But we're looking here at Matthew, at the readiness and preparedness that Christ has that regardless of the circumstances, we might know how it is that he's called us to live and what we might do to prepare ourselves and be ready for this inevitable, faithful promise fulfilled in his return. And I might also note to you that what we're studying today is specifically written to the church. Oftentimes when we look at these things, we think to ourselves, well, I'm included in Jesus, so whatever happens, happens. Right? Kind of dismissive. Um, when we look at this, I, I know uh, one guy, a friend of mine, he, says, uh, he believes in, in, in the pan theology of things, right? That in the end it all pans out, uh, which is fine. But what I've been impressed with over this last week is, is that these two examples of people are actually written directed to those who believe 
they're part of God's family. They're written and directed to, to two groups of people who, who believe they're part of the proceeding things of Christ, who are in His church. And it reminds me uh, of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So who are people who are saying, Lord, Lord, right? Those who believe that He's their Lord. <laughs> and Jesus said, Not everybody who does that is getting in. Why? Because not everybody that does that is doing the will of God. Well, what could they possibly be doing? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't rocket science. They might just be doing these things for themselves and selfish motives and, and, and kumbha and right, all the other things. But again, our lives are the pursuit of the things of Christ more and more in our lives so that our lives are transformed away from the things of the world and more and more into what He's called us to, being included in His Son, so that the day of revelation when He returns again, we will be included in glory with Him. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my Father is heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, uh, when did, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name, do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So it is not our, our work, our actions that include us in Christ, but our faith in Him, that we might know Him. And in our knowing, so grow, as I said before, to be prepared, ready, and actually begin to long for the glorious reappearing of Him at a time known only to the Father. Jesus said, blessed are those, right, who endure to the end, those are the ones who will be saved. Our two examples, chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, he goes on to explain to his disciples, the kingdom of heaven will be like... Okay, so now we've left the prophetic of these are the things that are going to be. And now he's teaching in parable like fashion what the kingdom will be like. What shall we compare the kingdom of God? It's like, okay, and then he shares this story. It'll be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. Now, Okay, uh, another time, another place, if we had more time, but the nursery people are already looking at me funny, how long is this going to take? Okay, here. <laughs> Jesus is making a picture, he's sharing a picture, and we see this often in Scripture, of the church's union with Christ like a wedding. Okay, the bride being the church, the bridegroom being Jesus, all of these different things. Now we get into this, the kingdom of heaven will be like, and it says ten virgins, and all of you are like, what? What? Weird, wow, wait, huh? Just say, and the kingdom of heaven will be like a wedding party. Can we say that? This is going to be like some chicks getting ready for a wedding. That's a rough translation. Okay? And five of them are foolish, and five of them are wise. That's the important part. Five are foolish, five are wise. Okay? Verse 3. The foolish took their lamps, but when they did, they took no oil with them. But the wise took a flask of oil with their lamps, and as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy, and they slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! And then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish ones said to the wise, Oh, 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 give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out! But the wise answered and said, Wait, since there's not be enough for you and us, go get your own oil! Go get your own oil. And so they do. And as they're going out, right, um, those who were already went with the marriage feast and the door was shut, verse 11, and after the other uh, virgin, the foolish ones, they came and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered saying, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. I read that, and your first thought is, oh, maybe, your first thought. 
your first thought might be, ah, uh, not fair. Not fair. Not fair. Why, why couldn't some of those wise chicks just give some of their oil? That's not very Christ-like of them. So, parables have limitation if we try to read into them what we want them to say as opposed to just letting it teach us what it says. And the point of this kingdom teaching is preparedness. Being prepared. In light of everything we're talking about, how do you go from groups one, two, three, to group four? Longing expectantly for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus. One, be prepared. Okay? Be prepared. And so in that preparation, we need to know that you, me, all of us individually, are individually accountable for our preparedness. When Jesus comes back, you can't say, hey, hey, get over it, get over it. Tell me again, what was the right answer when he asked me why I can come? Too late. There's a preparedness that needs to happen. Okay? It's, it's, it's not by association. Now, what's interesting is they're both challenged with the same thing. Well, I told you this is for the church. It's for the church. We don't know the hour when Jesus is going to come. And a matter of fact, it's been critiqued, right, of Christians for a long time. It says, you keep talking about Jesus coming again, but he's still not here. That's 2,000 years ago. He's still not here. He's still not here. Still not here, right? What Scripture say? He tarries because of his kindness, his patience, not wanting anyone to perish, but more to come to faith in Jesus. Be prepared. I also find it interesting that we're talking about lamps. Right? Lamps and oil. In, uh, Psalm 119 uh, I don't remember exactly the address. It's written down here somewhere, but for the sake of time. Psalm, Psalm 119, it says, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet. One step at a time. Right? In your flask with oil, your word's a lamp unto my feet. Be prepared. Spend time in God's word. Now, what does that look like practically for us today? Right? Uh, I liken it to, and maybe all of you either personally gone through this, like I have, or you've, met, well, personally you've gone through it one of two ways. Either you've been the one who suffered something awful, right? Or you're the one ministering to someone who's going through something awful, okay? And, and really, those are the foreshadow of the things yet to come, right? There's going to be hard things. Jesus never said at one place and point in time, did Jesus ever said, follow me, it'll be easy, he said, follow me, and they might hate you. Follow me, pick up your cross, die to self, right? I, but I tell you the truth, if you endure to the end, I've got you. I've got you. But the thing that I find in our lives today that's going to be closest to this, what happens someday, are people who have suffered and gone through horrible things. And we all know situations and places and points in time where someone is trying to make up in the middle of grief, trying to make up for what they didn't know about Jesus earlier. It's like, I was living my life, things are going fine, hunky-dory, woohoo, right? Boom! One morning, something happens, your whole life changes, everything up, upside down, right? Loss of job, death, can't, you, boom! And then the person's like, oh God! And then a whole bunch of stuff comes out of that. Now, there's a whole big group bunch of people who have continued to, right, in preparedness, spent time in God's Word and prayed and, and were filling, right? They had all the oil in their, 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 their extra, waiting for God to return, right? And there was a lamp under the seat, and you go through something difficult, and you have a relationship with Jesus that sustains you through that difficult time. That if everything else gets stripped away, I only need to know one thing, and that is, I don't care if I lose every possession I have in my life, I don't care if I lose my job. I don't care if this, I don't care if that, whatever he has, I know I belong to him and nothing can separate me from that. That's what it means to have your, 
have extra oil and have your, your lamp trimmed and you're ready to go and so forth and so on. I don't know anybody who's ever endured suffering, hardship, or any, any tribulation of the sort who ever said, wow, I guess I really did know too much about Jesus. I didn't need to know that. But I can think of plenty of people who are like, I should have, could have, or at first farm kids, it's like, hey, when do you make hay? When the sun is shining. There's another kingdom teaching. Continues on in verse 14. Okay? Uh, chapter 25, verse 1, the kingdom of heaven will be like... Chapter, four, uh, chapter 25, verse 14, continue. For it will be like, it will be like, it will be like, it will be like, chapter, verse 14, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to a southern, another one one, and to each according to his ability. So when he went away, he who had received the five talents went at once and traded it with him and made five more talents. So also the one who had two, he did the same thing. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, there's a theme, right? After a long time, the master of those came and settled accounts with him. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the five talents more, saying, Master, you've delivered to me five talents, and I've doubled it. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful, for you've been faithful over little. I will put you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And also, the guy who had two talents came forward saying, Master, you've delivered to me two talents, and here I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master, his master answered him and said, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I didn't sow and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have invested my money with the bankers. At least at the coming, I would have received what was owed by interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has, more will be given. But to him who has abundance, the one who has not even what he has will be taken away. And cast that worthless servant into outer darkness in a place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Two kingdom stories. Groups of people prepared, unprepared. And this final, right, with the same ending. Let us in, let us in. No, I don't know you. Here's your talent. I know you to be just this cruel, vindictive person, so I didn't want to, like, disappoint you take it. Oh, really? <laughs> cruel, vindictive, mean. You've got me pegged as a mean master. You don't know me very well, do you? Mean master. <laughs> I don't know any master who would be so blasted mean that he would actually give treasure to servants. It's just something to think about that, how moronic that guy's response is. What would drive a man to that? Right? Self-preservation, laziness. That is says, you, you slothful servant, right? You lazy, lazy. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a warning. There's no time to be lazy in the kingdom of God. None. Oh, yeah, but what about what people think of me? Stop it. Oh, people, right? We're not, we're not sitting there being accountable to the people who are coming back. We're accountable to the king who's coming back. And God has an economy about him. Right? The economy, we're studying the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And then what we need to know is that in that kingdom, there's an economy. There's a great treasure. And what is the greatest treasure that any of you can possess? Your relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 12 to say, e to each is given a measure of faith and the grace allotted to be able to do the things in the body that God has called us to do. That means that some of us have five talents and some of us have two, some of us have three and some of us have one, but he's called each and every one of us with different gifts and skills and talents to invest in the economy of heaven, which is the gospel. 
And so I'm asking you, who are you investing the kingdom in? Who are you, right? You want to be prepared to suffer through the enduring that's happening? You know the greatest way to grow in Christendom? The greatest way to grow in Christendom is to be obedient to King Jesus, who said, you need to love God and you need to love other people. And in order to demonstrate that, I'll give you one more commandment. Go and make disciples. Teach them what I've taught you. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Is it not a treasure to you? Yeah, it's a treasure to me. Go invest it in the lives of other people. And you'll grow. Because fascinatingly enough, what other people have, right? What other people have that you don't have is they've got questions that you didn't have. Your faith journey is full of your own questions that God answered graciously and mercifully through Scripture. And you found them. And you're like, woohoo! Okay? And now you're willing to share. And you're going to run into people that are going to have different questions than you did. Why? Because they have different backgrounds. They have different family of origin. They have different experiences. And they're going to want to ask you questions that you didn't ask. And then when you guys go through those things together, all of a sudden you're growing. And you're growing in the vision and sight of Christ. And you're seeing things completely different and full. And you're watching them do faithful things in your life and in the lives of other people. And you're so enamored by all of that that that's the fuel that goes out and shares with more. Now the one who's been entrusted with more, more will be given. Why? Because he just can't stop talking to people about Jesus. And who doesn't want to hear the words? Well done. Good and faithful. Come on. Bring your team up. In order to be prepared... Turn me back on. <laughs> In order to be prepared, excuse me, in order to grow. Because we all long for assurance. We all long, right, to be solidified in the things of God. What we must do is we must be prepared. Time in His Word, prayer, prayer, time in His Word, and investing in other people. Sharing with others the greatest treasure we've ever been shared.